I could not live with my conscience if I were responsible in any way for Carol's death, and I am not. Fred and Carol Newlander were part of a bustling Jewish community in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. This community had eight synagogues. Fred and Carol ran the largest one called Makor Shalom. Fred was the founder and senior rabbi at the synagogue. When Carol was found murdered in their house, questions and rumors began to fly. Who would want to murder this prominent member of the community? A rabbi's wife. Fingers started to point and investigators started to do a little digging. What they found shocked the community and left everyone in disbelief, including their three children. This is the story of Fred and Carol Newlander, the killer rabbi. Fred graduated Trinity College in 1963 at the age of 22. In the late 60s and early 70s, he quickly climbed the ranks to assistant rabbi. He was now one of the leaders at the large congregation of the Temple Emanuel Synagogue in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. In Cherry Hill, between 1960 and 1980, there was a huge population explosion. Everyone started to flood in to this area because it was a nice suburb outside of Philadelphia. It now was one of the largest Jewish populations in the area. With it, the economy started to boom as well. New shops were opening up almost daily. Fred and Carol met, quickly got married, and started having children. They had a daughter named Rebecca, a son named Matthew, and one other one that I couldn't find any information on. So uh, three kids, but I only know two of their names. With the large population growth and the Jewish community becoming very big in the area, Fred being the assistant rabbi at his current synagogue, started thinking that he could branch off and start his own synagogue and be very successful. The way Fred taught was a little different than all the other rabbis. He was very non-traditional. He would sometimes be seen wearing jeans and a sweatshirt to church. He was very laid back on all the traditional rules and would preach that way as well. So Fred decided that it was time to start his own synagogue. Him and his wife, Carol, along with their kids, started from scratch. They would go and try to start a congregation from literally nothing, basically from the ground up. They recall having church meetings in people's houses and at that time, their congregation was about 10 people. So they would basically have church at their house. They didn't have a formal synagogue. They didn't have a formal building to go to. However, word quickly spread how Fred did his teachings and the congregation quickly grew. Over the next five years, Fred and Carol lived and breathed growing their church. They started out with literally nothing and now were finally able to afford a small synagogue. They continued this way for the next 10 years. It's now been 15 years since they started their own synagogue, and it's now one of the most successfully ran churches in the area. It's called Makor Shalom, and it has the largest congregation in Cherry Hill. It's now the early 90s, and Fred and Carol's synagogue is busting at the seams. They are running out of room fast, and their congregation keeps growing. So they decided to break ground on a brand new 50,000 square foot building. At this time, their oldest daughter, Rebecca, was attending college in Philadelphia. Their son, Matthew, had ambitions to be a doctor and had recently accepted a job as an EMT on an ambulance crew. Now with all the success that Fred and Carol had, they moved into a very large colonial house. As you walk into this house, it's almost like getting to heaven. There is white everywhere. It almost is like it's glowing. There's so much natural light. The walls are white. The cabinets are white. Everything is white in this house. They wanted it to be pure. They wanted it to be their own thing. So when you stepped foot in this house, it looked like the cleanest thing possible. Now I tell you this picture because it does come into play later on. This house is spectacular. Also, Fred and Carol were obnoxiously clean people. You couldn't tell that they were raising children in that house. There was never a single thing out of place. 
I have a three-year-old and I can tell you our house is not like that. <laughs> um, obviously their kids were a little older, but yeah, there wasn't a single thing out of place in this house, which was a little creepy almost. It, it was like you're walking into some sterilization chamber. Uh, that's how clean this house was. And again, everything was white. Now, as busy as Fred and Carol were, they still saw a need in the community for something. There wasn't a single bakery that you could go to that had nothing but kosher bread. So Carol decided to take it upon herself and create a bakery that specialized in kosher food. As you can imagine, being such a large Jewish community, this bakery took off instantly. As soon as she opened the doors, there were lines waiting to get their fresh bread. Now, if you think about it, Fred is a rabbi in a very prominent Jewish community. He has the largest synagogue in the Cherry Hill area. His wife owns a bakery that specializes in kosher food. They are very busy people. However, Carol found time every single day to walk to the bakery and collect the cash that was in the drawer. She would then bring that cash back to their house for safekeeping. Now, in today's world, that seems like a crazy notion. You go and collect cash from your bakery every single day and you bring that pouch of cash back to your house for safekeeping instead of a bank or a safe or something like that. It seems a bit risky nowadays. However, this was the 90s and everyone was a little more laid back at this point. They trusted everyone in their community. So Carol had no issues ever taking that money from the bakery and bringing it back home. She felt safe. She felt like nothing would go wrong. Within this bag of money, Carol would sometimes be carrying thousands of dollars. Their daughter, Rebecca, would constantly tell her that she should not be carrying that much cash and they should not be storing it in their house. However, Carol and Fred just kind of brushed it off like they trusted their community, nothing would ever happen to them. Everyone is so nice and peaceful there. Rebecca was really the only person that saw the danger in what Carol was doing. Now back at the synagogue, obviously Fred being the founder and lead rabbi, always got called to bedside calls. If there was anyone sick or anyone dying, Fred would be the first one there. He was always making calls like this. So it wasn't unusual for Fred to get called out at odd times throughout the day or night. On one of these occasions, Fred got called to Ken Garland's house. Ken was in a relationship with a woman named Elaine Sansini. Now Elaine was the one to call Fred and say, hey, Ken is not doing well. Do you mind stopping by the house and saying some prayers with him? I'm not sure how long he's gonna last. He had cancer and was not doing well at all. Ken was a member of the McCor Shalom congregation. So Fred immediately got into his vehicle and drove over to the house. Elaine, his girlfriend at the time, was a popular radio show host. When Fred got there, the situation was dire. Ken did not last through the night. He ended up passing away that day as Fred was saying prayers over him. However, this time was a little different. Elaine Sonsini was a very attractive woman. Once Ken passed away, Fred and her began talking and they actually bonded over this whole situation. Soon after Ken's death, they held a memorial service and Fred was one of the main speakers at that memorial service. Shortly after that, Fred and Elaine began talking again. This time, it led to an affair. The extramarital affair lasted for over two years and Fred was a rabbi cheating on his wife. Fred and Elaine were so serious with this relationship that Fred actually converted her from Catholicism to Judaism. Elaine was now Jewish and part of the Makor Shalom congregation, where her boyfriend was the founding rabbi. Now, around this same time, there was some talk in the congregation that there was a person in need of help. His name was Len Jenoff, and he was an alcoholic. There were a lot of people in the community that were concerned for Len because most people knew about him. He was basically the local alcoholic that everyone knew had issues, but no one really wanted to do anything to help him. However, the congregation at Makor Shalom took it upon themselves to try to help Len. And the person leading the charge was none other than Fred himself. So Fred took Len Jenoff under his wing and began counseling him privately. Now Len Jenoff was a very interesting person. He stated several times that he was in the CIA, he was ex-FBI. He told everyone that while in the CIA, 
he tried to assassinate Fidel Castro three times. At this point, no one really took Len seriously. He had so many crazy stories. He also said that he was special forces in Vietnam. Len had so many stories that everyone just kind of laughed it off. No one actually believed any of this. However, Len was now so devoted to Fred because Fred decided to help him out and take him under his wing that he was actually caught saying, I would do anything for Fred. Now life continued as usual. Everyone was so busy. Fred was busy managing the congregation. Carol was busy with her bakery and helping with the church as well. Fred was even more busy because he was still maintaining his extramarital affair with Elaine. How did he have the time to do all of this? I do not know. <laughs> But this extramarital affair with Elaine Sonsini was starting to take a turn. Elaine was becoming irritated with Fred. Fred continued to promise Elaine that he was going to divorce his wife and be with her. However, the divorce never came and Elaine was getting antsy. It was now mid-August and Elaine gave Fred an ultimatum. She said if he wasn't divorced by the end of the year, she was going to end the relationship with him. This ultimatum drove him crazy. He wasn't sure what to do with it. He basically had everything he wanted. He had a wife, he had kids, and he had his little side piece that no one knew about that he could go to for extra support and extra other things. Um, so he had the perfect life in his eyes. So this ultimatum was driving him crazy. He didn't want to lose any of it. The interesting fact about this whole thing though was it's not unheard of in the Jewish community for the rabbis to get a divorce. It's not against their rules or religion. So we're not exactly sure why Fred just didn't go through with the divorce if he wasn't happy with Carol. It obviously wouldn't make him look great, but having an affair with your wife makes you look even worse. Fred, however, did not want to lose Elaine. So he began to plot out how he was gonna get out of his marriage without losing the congregation that he worked so hard to get. It's now November 1st, 1994, and the timeline for this ultimatum was getting closer. Fred was starting to panic a little bit. The day was busy as usual. It was 6 p.m. and Fred just got done putting a full day in at the synagogue. As he was driving home, he decided to stop and grab some pizza for him and his son, Matthew. Matthew was waiting for his shift to start as an EMT. When Fred got home, him and his son both ate the pizza, then Matthew left for his shift. Fred knew that Carol had a financial meeting for the bakery that night, so she wouldn't be home until later. So this gave Fred some time. He drove back to the synagogue to get some extra work done. Carol got done with her financial meeting around 8 p.m. Arriving home around 8.15, she called her daughter Rebecca. Fred, at this time, was still at the synagogue trying to get his last bit of work done before heading home for the night. While Carol was on the phone with Rebecca, she opened up her purse and took out a large wad of cash and put it in their safe. This cash was from the financial meeting that she just returned from. She continued to talk to Rebecca then suddenly there was a knock at the door. Rebecca seemed a little concerned that there would be a knock at the door at 8.30 at night. She told her mom not to answer it. However, Carol said that she was actually expecting a package from someone from the congregation and that she would call Rebecca right back. She just wanted to go get the package quick and then she would call her back. And before she hung up, Carol said, oh, it's the bathroom man. To which she explained that a couple days prior, someone came to the door with a package and then asked to use the bathroom. This person lingered in the bathroom for a little bit, then left and went on his way. She didn't know his name, but it seemed to be the same exact person. As Carol was walking to the door, she opened it, said hi to the person on the other side, then hung up the phone with Rebecca. No harm, no foul. It was now 9 p.m. and Fred was finally on his way home from the synagogue. As he arrived home, Fred opened the door expecting to see their brilliant white furnishings in their house. Again, white walls, white interior, white finishings, everything was white. However, when he swung that door open and looked inside, all he saw was red. There was blood everywhere. Carol was laying in the foyer dead. There was blood sprayed up the walls. There was a pool of blood on their white carpeting. There was blood everywhere. Fred immediately called 911, frantically saying that his wife was laying on the floor in a pool of blood and he didn't know what to do. 911, state the emergency. I, 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 I,
I just came home. And my wife is home this morning. And there's blood all over. The 911 operator said paramedics are on the way. Then Fred came to a realization. His son Matthew was an EMT and was most likely going to be on that call. Frantically, he told the operator, please do not send my son here. Make sure the responding ambulance does not have my son on it. Fortunately for Matthew, the operator listened and did not dispatch him. He did not show up at this crime scene until hours later. The first 24 hours of this investigation was pure chaos. This was a mostly calm and safe community. Things like this didn't happen very often. So a murder investigation, let alone from a local rabbi of the largest synagogue in the area, was unheard of. The initial investigation was looking into burglary. However, it was quickly pointed out that nothing was taken. They didn't have any suspicion of burglary after they looked through the house. Money was laying around that wasn't taken. Jewelry wasn't taken. Literally nothing of value was taken from the house. So they were kind of stumped as to what happened. Why would someone break into this house and kill a very prominent person in the community just for fun. It didn't make sense. The following day after this murder happened, thousands of people gathered at the synagogue to pray. Back at the crime scene, while everyone was praying, investigators noted that Carol had been beaten severely. This murder just keeps getting more twisted by the second. Reporters began gathering outside of the house very quickly. This became national news. Rumors immediately began to fly that Fred must have had something to do with it. Another rumor that Fred was having an extramarital affair with someone from the congregation also started. These rumors were mostly brushed aside by the investigators. As they didn't really have any evidence, it was more of a he said, she said type of thing, and they didn't have anything to go on. So they were kind of brushed under the rug, but saved for later. However, behind the scenes, there were a couple investigators that just would not let this smoke clear. They knew that the amount of rumors coming in and the amount of people from the congregation saying that Fred was having an affair just wasn't something that they could look past. They had to investigate this further. Three months after the murder, the local tabloids actually picked up and printed that Fred was one of the lead suspects in his wife's murder. The pressure was mounting, so Fred decided to make a public statement and confirm that the extramarital affair rumors were true. However, he made it a point to state that he would never kill Carol. He ended up having to step down as the rabbi of Makor Shalom. A new rabbi was appointed and Fred basically had nothing to do with his church anymore. Meanwhile, while all this was happening, the investigation was still moving on. Investigators have now officially ruled out burglary. They were looking at something a little more sinister here. They instead changed their focus to the rabbi. However, they didn't have any evidence to go on. They had nothing to prove Fred had anything to do with Carol's death. What they didn't know was in the background, Len Jenoff, the local alcoholic that had all of the crazy stories about the CIA, and the FBI and being in Vietnam was actually hired as a private investigator by Fred. The one thing that did hold true about Len was he had his private investigator's license. Who knew? Len was now in charge of all of the communication for Fred. Len was the one doing all of the news conferences, all of the press meetings. He was basically acting as his private investigator and attorney. The investigators grew suspicious over Len Jenoff but their end goal was to get a little closer to Elaine Sonsini. They wanted to know everything that Elaine knew, as she was probably the closest person to Fred at the time of the murder. They began questioning her very frequently, and they actually turned her into an informant for the investigators. Elaine would now record all of her phone conversations with Fred. However, Fred wasn't dumb. He would always say things on the phone, like he just wanted what was best, he wanted to follow the process. He trusted the criminal justice system. He never budged a single step out of place. He was locked down. Elaine eventually broke off the relationship because she just couldn't take the pressure anymore. Once she broke off the relationship, she asked for police protection. She did not trust Fred at all. Her police protection was granted and she was assigned an officer named Larry Leaf. The weird part about this whole situation was Larry and Elaine eventually got married. 
Larry resigned from the police force and him and Elaine left the state. They were just gone. No one knew really what happened. It was later discovered that Larry Leaf, the officer assigned to protect Elaine, was questioned about Carol's murder. He was questioned because he was found looking through the investigator's files. It was later noted that he was just feeding information to Elaine and nothing else really came of it. In August of 1995, almost a year after Carol's murder, a local newspaper wrote an article that theorized Fred hired a hitman to kill his wife. This generated so much publicity that Fred decided for the first time since his wife was murdered to do a press conference. However, what people don't realize is Fred is an experienced public speaker. He was a rabbi for most of his life. He knew how to speak in public and he was very good at it. He got on camera and denied any involvement in Carol's murder and made it a very convincing argument. Over the next two years, investigators continued to dig into this case. However, they were losing traction. This was essentially a cold case at this point. They went as far as to call Elaine Sonsini and Len Genoff into a grand jury to try to indict them. They really just wanted to question them under oath. After questioning them, the grand jury decided that they weren't going to press charges. There just wasn't enough evidence on any of it. However, the judge saw it differently. The judge actually gave the green light to go arrest none other than Fred Newlander. He was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. However, no one thinks this charge is gonna stick because the evidence just isn't there. Even Fred is basically laughing this whole thing off. What he doesn't know is in the background, investigators keep questioning Len Genoff. Len also is still meeting with reporters because he kind of likes the spotlight. One news reporter by the name of Nancy Phillips seems to be getting more information out of Len than anyone else. It turns out that Len kind of fancies her. So in an off the record conversation, Len Genoff told Nancy that Fred Newlander hired him to kill his wife and paid him $30,000 to do so. However, this is off the record. So Nancy can't really use any of it. She could probably go to the police herself, but that would go against her whole moral code of being a journalist. This conversation was off the record and that's kind of like an unspoken rule. You don't out your sources. So Nancy continued to meet with Len and finally convinced him to go to the investigators with this information. With Nancy in tow, Len Genoff decided that he would meet with the lead investigators over coffee and dinner. They basically had to wine and dine him to get this information. That's just how Len worked. During this dinner, Len Genoff confessed to everything. He also implicated Paul Daniels as an accomplice. Len told the investigators that Fred hired him as a hitman to kill his wife because he needed to get out of that relationship so he could be with Elaine. He paid him $30,000 and Len accepted. After the confession, Len told Nancy that she was free to write it in her newspaper article. He told the investigators that he finally confessed to everything because he wasn't sure if he would be able to hold it together during Fred Newlander's conspiracy to commit murder charge. He said once he got in front of the jury, he wasn't sure if he was gonna be able to keep the lie going. So he decided to just tell the truth now and not have to worry about it. He also told investigators that he wanted to bring Nancy in on this whole journey because he kind of had a crush on her. Mm -hmm. What a catch. <laughs> Jenoff's confession was 90 pages long. This guy liked to talk and he liked to be braggadocious a little bit. So he wrote a 90 page long confession. In the confession, he wrote extreme detail of how he went to the house that night, knocked on the door, was let in, then beat her and killed her. He then said he drove away from the crime scene to a local mall area where he dumped the murder weapon in a dumpster. He then said he drove to Philly where he dumped Carol's purse the only thing that he took that night, into a dumpster near a river. Len made a deal to plead guilty to a lesser charge if he testified against Fred Newlander. Fred was now charged with capital murder, which came with a possible death sentence. Fred was denied bail, which also made major news headlines. The trial began in late 2001, seven years after his wife's murder. The first trial resulted in a hung jury. 
So there was light at the end of the tunnel for Fred. He could possibly get out of this whole charge. However, on the second trial, his family turned against him. With all of the news reports coming out and all of the evidence building up against Fred, all three of his children turned against him in the second trial. They all became witnesses for the prosecution. Fred, at the second trial, was found guilty, and his son Matthew took the stand and told the jury how he thought his father was guilty. After he was found guilty, the jury decided to spare his life and not give him the death penalty. He was sentenced to 30 years to life. He was interviewed by Barbara Walters where he said he was enraged by what happened and also saddened that all of his kids testified against him. That is my story of the killer rabbi Fred Newlander. If you like this content, leave me a comment and subscribe for more. Thanks everybody.